Okay, so hi everybody. We are stepping into the June um, first virtual reading for Marion Poetry Center and we have five fantastic readers to join us today for Marion Poetry Center's first virtual reading uh, so for the traveling show. So we have the first reader is Virginia Barrett. Virginia, take it over. <laughs> we can't hear you. Thank you. How about now? Yes. <laughs> Unmuted. That should work, right? <laughs> Thank you for including me in uh, the June reading. And um, June is my birthday month, so it's a special month for me. So in trying to decide what poems to read, I focused on uh, June poems, which involves uh, some summer activities. So uh, my first poem, it follows a form by the Nobel Prize winning Spanish poet Vicente Alexandre, My Sight. I was born one June night amid contrast. Show me something. I am learning to see. I was born. If we could only compose the longing, the twilight strokes with ease. I was born. Our image rose holy, a vision under the sleeping flame, a fox pushing, pushing. The city, a crumpled map, Lines in the palm of the hand, a burning abstract. Everything is now possible. The canvas stretched, the pigments crushed, the brush, the infill of shapes without implication that roam like eyes or river pebbles, like a blank orb that reflects. Look in the altering light. My next poem takes us to the Haight-Ashbury district in San Francisco, where I had an art studio at one time, mid-June. I leave Goodwill with a book for you. On hate and coal, a guy sings Cat Stevens. His old guitar plugged into a small amplifier. I linger to catch the chorus, then walk toward the library on page to see if poetic memory is waiting for me. It's after 3 p.m. and the wind is picking up. I can feel the fog creep its way over the park as I could always sense snow coming when I was a girl. Vermont has nothing to say to this West Coast weather Seasons so vague they end up being one continuous wave. A taste carried you back four decades this morning, eating white fish for breakfast. Grandma Gussie offering you the same in Yiddish at her Brooklyn table when you were a kid. Two generations nearly gone. I mourned my mother most in winter. These next two poems were written at Armstrong Redwood State Natural Reserve, where I've camped many times. Forgetting. Here is your gallery, the strip of remains, trestles and ties, decks, tables and chairs, sawmill by Kashea Falls. Black birds with beady eyes eat crumbs, greedy for them. Crows throated call lower than the drum of the dry stream bed. Trees that give off their own dark rain hide light from our eyes. Come back, come back down here. Trillium, sword in bracken ferns, forest theater of bats to grow to be felled the crash of 1400 years walking alone 
transfixed, slow mind sleep. Voles never come down to the ground, going inward when they can't speak. Envisioning the murelet's ocean flight each day, everything enveloped in fog. They dream whatever you died to remember. This next poem starts with an epigraph by Robert Bly, and it also follows a form he invented called the Ramage. And I encourage everyone to try one out. <laughs> it's an 85 syllable poem with eight lines, and it involves a lot of interior rhyming. So look up the Ramage by Robert Bly. It was among ferns I learned about eternity. Groves. Under rock's hood, rattlesnake coils. His wet trails dull glistening, the good banana slug. What would drowned wasps wish from water pails? They nearly cut down all the redwoods, stump town. Quit when only the final groves stood. Their girls could pick checker lilies still, hound's tongue. Should trees bear names of lumber barons? Old woodpecker taps out time. Chain furl ferns uncurl. Now we can head to the Russian river. <laughs> river sketch, Monte Rio. Small carn on beach, cackle of birds under bridge. Old pine, old pine, hotel sign. Mother paddles a green canoe. Child scouts crouched in the bow. The currents low flow, this drought. A line of ducks, drops of rain, minnows thirst. One seagull's screech follows the river to the coast. Now the next two poems are from the Yuba River where I've also camped in the summertime. This first one has an epigraph by Charles Wright who actually was one of my poetry professors as an undergraduate at University of Virginia. To walk hard in the bright places. And uh, just to, since you can't see the poem and Anna's blue is a type of butterfly. Stepping beside the Yuba. A flutter of Anna's blue rise above the slow current flow before collecting again. The heated body of rock knows such waiting is to breathe. A coherent scattering of light on the scales, they cling loosely to the wing, come off without harm. The river speaks in many forms. What we once expressed in gold flecks, more scintillating than our field of vision. You said, the swallowtail landing on my arm will always surprise. Clouds are snow-capped Sierra. Snow-capped Sierra are clouds. Stepping beside the Yuba number two. The storm seeped water inside, but the tent held out. Thunder louder than the roar of the North Fork below. But still, we slept some. The heavy footsteps over us of neighbors replaced by sounds of open space. 
space above the soaring trees of downlit and drowning stars. No Venus, but a planetary light in mind. Morning comes with an urgency, racket of birds beside this deep river pool. Green snake moves through water as the water between rocks. And I'll end with a final one from um, the Vedanta retreat in Olima. If any of you have ever had the pleasure of spending contemplative time there. And if not, I encourage you to go there. And this one starts with an epigraph by the Mexican Greek poet, Omera Arides. White glow of the mind of a crane or a god. White. Morning overcast, white deer under a near white sky, damp white daisies here and here, a bush full of white star shapes I can't name. The path through the forest is marked by white paint on the rough bark of trees at night. Owl is white, and the space in our eyes through which he flies. Thank you. So beautiful. Very beautiful, Virginia. Thank you. Your reading voice. Uh, and then Charles Wright, who is who was one of my favorite poets, actually. Um, trees, pines, rivers, thunder. Beautiful reading. Thank you so much. So upcoming, our next reader is Shelley Chowsley. Shelley, take it over. Thank you, Anne, and thank you, Virginia. And thanks for being here, everyone. Uh, I will be reading from a book that came out in October from Longship Press called Come Back Behind Your Eyes, as well as several new pieces. This first one is set Lakeside in South Central New Hampshire of loons and lakes. You loon are lake launching skyward. Wings keep oars beats unfit for land. Your water nature ripples with runaway clues rife in the fear of fishes. Lady Lake shapeshifts, frogs pulse shiny in her palm she revels in shadows, savvy flitting fish schools, suns her bottom in the shallows of mud lazy places. But you loon, you leave her behind each autumn, laboriously, fitfully claiming sky. Like old broken Willie, the pond jumping plain, I'm shore bound. You make your peace with air and haul yourself away. May's spring spell obliges. You track this way again to scrape a nest, both moist and dry. You covet that edge where liquid meets form. Checkered breast rests half in water. Where invisible loon mothers tune in humming, privy to the ways of lakes and loons, ready to mount their laugh-ridden opera as Lady Lake Laps close. This one is called Jailbreak. The experience it springs from occurred after new double pane windows were very snugly installed in a very old country house. So we had some foreseeable but unforeseen consequences. I waken to ghost and shrouded house. No seeing out. No seeing in, I'm imprisoned in cling wrap white. I cross pools of condensation, stuff of seance magic, water walk linoleum, flinch from cellar door, now slimy. Soon as fretting gets impressive, no seeing in, no seeing out, 
just restless, sapping haunt of wraiths. Drip dry, shifting shrouds, bat-like in the attic, my jailbirds whisper louder. I'll crack the windows, one by one, slower, faster, in between, just in case it matters. And despite torrential rain, I'll fling wide the doorways, back and front and side. So welcome the touch, moist heat, wet cheeks, sound of pounding rain, nearly drowns the whirring rush of ghosts by the dozens, lifting off, cruising through, immaterial, forgotten. The grass so green, it cuts your feet. Uh, this next one, I use repetition in here, um, more in alignment with the content of this poem, as you'll see. It doesn't really meet requirements for a formal repeating verse, but it was fun. Dementia's plea. Dementia's plea. Please set me free before I completely cut loose in a hijacked car no one wants, top down, driving brazen, danger to self and maybe others. In a hijacked car no one wants, I set off to explore my brain's back roads, boasting dead ends and rotaries I circle in a drain-wise direction. I set off to explore my brain's back roads, but the map is not the territory I know from Grant's stellar anatomy atlas, where everything's tamed by name. But the map is not the territory I know, I stop for coffee between lobes and fissures, buy more time, number neurons, guess at Gray's recession rate. I stop for coffee between lobes and fissures. Scenery advances, an unswallowable stew. Without honey thickener, without proffered spoon, I cannot taste where I am going. Scenery advances, an unswallowable stew. Surely it will engulf me in its wake. I head for higher ground by feel, frontal lobes reeling beneath these knees. Surely it will engulf me in its wake. Please set me free lest I disappear. Lost in my brain's back roads, my frontal lobes can't answer the phone. Um, here's one that leads with one of my favorite summer things. Summer's corn husks, bunched forlorn, wrenched from cobs and tossed unloved, left to musk in saggy bags. Tassels, silkies, come shine silver fish-like underfoot. Yesterday's towel askew with dew, now draped for lakeside blazing, smolders dry at your approach. Clouds close in like a wet blanket still, brewing rain. Day crickets sing unsynced, lone goose honks above, single barks like shots next door, puncture intermittent trilling, tingle electric in your fingers. Only chipmunk, Grayford squirrel keep mute vigil of industry, magnificently acorn focused. They combust into encounters, chest bump scuffles, while rooster referees next door, you feel your digits quicken. Soon a world subdued, water bursts its cloudy bounds, pummeling roof, thud poured to ground, settling into thunder and light. Dog makes for you like hivewoods be, unquestioned harbor from the storm. You meet her need as best you're able, grip her solid with your knees. She's no way of knowing just how much lightning loves you. Um, two more here. This one is brand new. It's called Days like these. Eye to eye with jungle of lantana. Who knows whose eyes abide inside? I'm diverted by neon green aiming for my knee. 
some minute fly I've new espied, diverted now by your heartbeat in my hand, so close it scares, knocking on my palm, the beat, the skips. Hearts are best forgotten, left to their devices, lest our minds come to rest on how they never do. Hint of inhale above, prefacing owl sound, wind up for a hoot. It's but a dog. By time of day, by frequency, by singular way air bends around that second word, alcanus familiaris, yap chatter, superficialis. I decide on a dog raised by owls for this hooting bark intrusion. Somehow puppy up a tree, somehow nest capacious, somehow voles, bats, and lizards suffice for mother's nipples. I don't get pup safe to ground though. I'm up, on, and away, all fast twitch viscera, away from your warm eyes, your tumor pocked sun basking flesh, your troublesome fasts, your skeletal frame, the tremble in your pelvis. You restless, sticky presence, looking for the exit while I concoct broths and staying spells you research euthanasia. Okay, now for the last one. This one is called Autumn Jots. Leaves lose hold, ground bound, a plethora of colorful death. Seeming same of living green, they had declared themselves by shape instead, belonging by way of difference. Why is there variety? Each patch of earth match made for oak, for maple or sumac, leaves shaped by fractal magic, each inlet, point and bay, determined once some long ago, now gened into being by acorn, by pod, by cone. Going brown now, losing shape, ready mixed in rusting heaps by wind's capricious broom. Who misbound for spring's next crop, nascent in mother trees? One night, one night I won through to the peace of seeds, going to ground for good, I'm topsoil for what made me possible. It seems like an elegant plan. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Uh, thank you, Charles Le Shelley. Sorry, uh, I'm stunned by all your uh, imagery, the wild, wild imagery, and the beautiful re resolution, all resolution toward the end of the your reading. It's beautiful. Really appreciate it. Okay, and then we are taking to um to the next reader, Deborah Bashel Schmidt. Thank you, Anne. It's wonderful to be included here today and to hear all of this terrific poetry. I became a grandmother one year ago yesterday, so I'm treating you to a suite of grandmother poems. The first is a cycle of four poems called Birth Poems. One, fear. Her time is near, so near that I find it hard to sleep. I imagine she is sleepless too. When it was my time, I was not this fearful, but for my daughter, I imagine and try not to imagine all possible threats. I think and try not to think of my grandmother who almost died giving birth to my mother, her only child, and who never again slept with my grandfather. I think of my mother, two weeks overdue, running Ocean Beach from the cliff house to the zoo, and then laboring alone in an old padded cell at the army hospital, twisting the bare mattress off its steel frame with each fierce contraction, 
no company but the grim matron who at interminable intervals glared through the barred window before disappearing down the hall. I think of the endless wall of pain that was my first labor. I tell myself that childbirth is safer now that we are here as proof. This first granddaughter will make us the three latest in a long unbroken strand of mothers and daughters. I invoke the power of the generations, the ancient sequence of mothers to safeguard us through this paralyzed, this treacherous passage, this dangerous translation in which life risks even itself for its own continuance. Two, altar. I build a birth altar. A small leather-bound book of illuminated capitals from the Canterbury Psalter is turned to the letter O. O is for open, for the moon that rules our courses, for female genitalia, for the circle of life. Pottery bowls, two nut brown, one sea blue traced with waves, speak of earth and tides, their rims of clay stretching like the cervix around the descending head. My daughter threw and glazed the blue bowl, and she waxed and dyed the three pisanki, eggs in intricate stained glass patterns of scarlet, cobalt, emerald, black, kaleidoscopic feathers and poppies. Beads of lapis and cloisonne strung one after another on a strong silk cord honor great-grandmother, grandmother, mother, daughter, and granddaughter-to-be. For weightlessness, breath, and endurance, I choose a tiny enamel bird and plumes of quail, thrush, and peacock. I bring a candle made with fir needles for the light it gives and for the rooted fragrant strength of trees. In the blue bowl, I place a stem of climbing rose, one bloom in bud, one in its prime, and one full-blown. And last comes a little bronze mouse who stands next to the Celtic O with paws uplifted, sniffing the air, sharing her animal blessing, the easy parturition we bipedal creatures gave up in learning to walk upright. Three, incantation. Bowl, bead, feather, seed. O is for open, hear my spell. Water, earth, flower, birth. May my child and her child be well. Four, amulet. There is one more thing I must prepare for the birth altar. On a miniature clay tablet, I stamp an ancient charm. Sator arepo tenet opera rotas. Five letters across, five down. It is a perfect palindrome that magically reads the same in all directions. Its meaning has been obscured by the passage of millennia, but through all that time, women near childbirth have worn it as an amulet incised in stone inscribed on parchment or embroidered on linen. They have even eaten the letters written in butter or cheese. The Sator Square has been found in Pompeii, Corinium, Duro Europas, in a Carolingian Bible. Is it Jewish, Roman, or Christian, Stoic, Orphic, Mithraic? Scholars continue to argue, but we don't care. In our need, we reach for magic. We want to believe that in this potent rebus resides the power to make our own small world come right. That the elegance of this archaic construction touches the divine. At its very center is the letter N, perhaps for no man, the ineffable name. Of the many translations possible, I choose. The sower guides the wheels with care. Sator arepo tenet opera rotas. And then she was born. 
This one is called For Juniper. Eight weeks old and already granddaughter of mine. Life can be so hard sometimes. This morning you were fed and changed, sleepy but fighting hard not to relinquish your newfound consciousness. I lift you from your mother's arms, nestle you against my chest, and step out onto the cabin porch. Your eyes, twin alpine lakes reflecting wind-tossed pines, widen as you take in trees and sky, and you are suddenly calm because you still know what we only try to remember. We walk down the cabin road, and in minutes your soft head grows heavy under my chin, your little warm body letting go into mine, your dark eyes closing. You are named for what is rooted in the earth, what sends tender exploring fronds into sun and sky, what rounds frosted blueberries and gives them up to us for the healing. May sun, sky, and your sister trees always call you home. At the piano. Ten months old, she sits beside me on the bench, splashing away with both hands, sending up bright sprays of notes, alternately singing along lustily and laughing for the sheer glory of it all. Rows and rows of black and white keys, the thundering vibration of unseen strings. What a gift in the seventh decade of my life to cast off the fear of mistakes, the schooled quest for precision, the veneration of the greats, to be reminded by this tiny wise person of wondrous possibility and joy. And the last one, crossing the bridge. Crossing the bridge with the baby tiniest of birds, balanced high on a railing, a young black-chinned hummingbird in a rare moment of quiescence, a creature that normally lives in a blur, 80 strokes a second, 250 breaths, and 1,200 heartbeats a minute, now miraculously poised long enough for me to see its miniature mermaid scales, to hear its almost supersonic peeping. Juniper, nearly asleep, needs to keep moving, so I walk her back and forth, unwilling to leave while the little bird is still with us. It must look as though I'm waiting for someone, as if I've said, meet me under the hummingbird, as if a hummingbird could be a landmark, like a fountain or a clock right here. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. This is so beautiful. That's so much joy in all this, the femininity, the maidenness. Wow. Um I um I'm I'm so that's so much beauty in it. I I have to read more of your work. Definitely. And then thank you and congratulations, you know. For being the grandmother okay and then let's let's have our next reader alice raw benjamin to take away alice alice okay are you there yes i am um Great daydreaming for just a moment. Uh, so I, um, you know, broke my, my toe. I broke my toe yesterday at the swimming pool where my husband and I swim. And so I brought out this poem, Ode to My Broken Toe. Here's to my toes, I count all 10. We count them once and back again, may they dance and may they sing and keep doing that upright thing. 
let's take care of all our toes, 20 odd with mine and thine. Let's wiggle them both day and night while drinking buckle beer and wine. If we had none, we'd have to crawl. So here's to toes, we love them all. Big old harvest moon. Here come that big old moon, creeps out the side edge of that up cloud. He got a pollen yellow halo like what's on the bee's knees. He got a right to shine. With a smile on sideways, oh, Mr. Moon, he must be making that moon shine again. Cockroaches in heaven. Epigraph. Now I was thinking of Archie the cockroach who writes poetry at night on a typewriter from the book Archie and Mehitable by Don Marquis, 1916. Cockroaches in heaven. At night, they scurry from the cupboard, hunting daytime crumbs. So delicious. Whoever makes this food is such an expert that even the scraps are ambrosial treats. Who could imagine the actual meal? This heart of mine is full of rooms and rooms, all vacant, beautiful. Of course, the heart does not have eyes. So I am in the dark here, delighted like a cockroach in heaven. I read a poem by my mother, Wisconsin poet from her book. Um, the cows that listen to music give more milk. Apparently this her epigraph is, says the ad for business music. Sure, jerseys like jazz, Swiss like yodels, Holsteins like country, Charolais like opera, Guernseys like symphonies, Black Angus like hip hop, Brahmas like reggae, At our shires like Irish, Frisians like philharmonics. They all like bluegrass. The name of stone. One. We are speaking, said the radio host, of the death of language. And then asked her guests, so how many people speak yours? Eleven, the native replied. Eleven, the interview so few, and I was too. Two, as he lay face up in the Antarctic night, the expedition member pieced together ancient names for constellations. Then, slowly, he began to sense the absence of names in this place where no indigenous people had ever lived. Not the name we call you by, but your very own. My language is so slow, you could not hear me if I told you, the stone replied. I'd like to read a poem by Ellery Akers, who I think is still a member of Grin Poets Poetry Center. The 
the word that is a prayer. One thing you know when you say it, all over the earth, people are saying it with you. A child blurting it, blurting it out as the seizures take her. A woman reciting it on a cot in a hospital. What if you take a cab through the tenderloin at a street light? A man in a wool cap, yarn unraveling across his face, knocks at the window. He says, please. By the time you hear what he's saying, the light changes, the cab pulls away. And you don't go back, though you know someone just prayed to you the way you pray. Please. A word so short it could get lost in the air as it floats up to God like the feather it is, knocking and knocking, and finally falling back to earth as rain, as pellets of ice, soaking a black branch and collecting in drains, leaching into the ground. You walk in that weather every day. Let's see. It's the moon, the old woman, the tulip, and the dog. Epigraph in homage to Elisa, Alicia Ostreicher's delightful collection of poetry. I never worry about the moon, said the tulip. It passes high above over and over again. I enjoy it especially in late summer when the hot sun has wilted me, those nights the moonlight shines gently on my delicate petals. The moon? What do you think I'm howling at? said the dog. That's it for me. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Elise. That's uh, that's a lot of uh, musing moments. Um, I enjoyed your reading very much. Two generation of po poets and writers. Someone just wrote, and I I echo. Uh, what is your mother's name? Could you let us know that? You can write to the chat space for us. That would be great. Okay, and um. We will, uh, this is wonderful hour. And then we have our last uh, reader who is Jody Hotel. Jody, take it over. Thank you. Um, thanks to everyone for being here. And uh, thanks especially Anne for hosting and um, to the Marin Poetry Center for having the series. Um, I don't know any of the other poets that have read and it's been a real pleasure to hear and uh, see you. So I am coming from my home on the unceded lands of the Southern Pomo. And I'm gonna read all recent poems. I'm writing a series of poems riffing off of Japanese proverbs and I'm gonna share three of them with you. So in each case, the uh, title of the poem is the proverb itself, translated into English. So the first one is, the day you decide to do something is a lucky day, Japanese proverb. The pilgrim muttered the ancient proverb to himself, for a desired journey to the remote shrine but always had some reason to postpone. The birth of his daughter, the pestilence-stricken rice crop, his wife's illness and death. Now in his 80th year, his knees pained him, his hip was stiff, and he winded easily. Who was the thief who had stolen his youth? Still, the pilgrim decided that this was his lucky day, he donned his cape, clutched his juzu beads and staff, and set out on the journey. He muttered curses as the barrier set in his mind proved true. Hill after steep hill rose up ahead. A sudden storm drenched him. 
He was mistaken. This was not his lucky day, foolish old man. As he was about to turn back, a scent from the past drew him on. The pilgrim labored up the path to the crest. Beneath him lay veil after veil, rise upon rise of blossoming cherries, pink and white clouds of heaven. And the next one and the next proverb is, has to drink the whole sea to learn what it tastes like. And um, you don't have, I hope you don't have to know this to appreciate the poem, but since you can't see it on the page, I will tell you that um, it's a golden shovel of the proverb. So meaning the last word in each line is, um, a word in the proverb that was a form invented by Terence Hayes. Has to drink the whole sea to learn what it tastes like. Beware the one who has endless thirst and wants to swallow each and every food and drink, not even tasting either the brine or sugar, leaving the whole earth hungry and thirsty, the sea bottom barren, not a sip the one who has much has much to learn but the one who savors what is given each morsel each drop delights in it more the spice the tang tastes more of life's bounty knows what the salt tastes like okay and the last one of these um is Tomorrow, another wind will be blowing. And this one is just, the poem is just considering all different kinds of wind, changing winds. Tomorrow, another wind will be blowing. The wind brought ill luck today, but that will change. And before long, good fortune will blow in. This day's fierce gale grows kinder tomorrow. Soon, that gentle wind will still leaving you in the doldrums. Then swerve, blasting you far out to sea. Today, the Scirocco swings in from the south. Next day, the Mistral gusts from the northwest. Squalls down an aging redwood. A zephyr shakes rain from the plum tree, scatters blossoms. Breezes cool my face. Music, the wind chimes, lift up the prayer flags. Okay, and I'm going to close with two recent poems um, in a totally different tone. These are poems which use an aphora, and I think most of you realize that means it plays a lot with repetition. Um, and I seem to have an obsession with M dashes so if anybody doesn't know, that's the extra long dash. It's my favorite mark of punctuation. This first one's, it's possible. Maybe I'll recuse myself from here on or be redacted, which is okay with me. Maybe I'll come back as a pampered pooch. Maybe I'll go viral and make lots of moolah. Solve Wordle on the first try. Maybe I'll become fluent in Italian, amore mio. Write a Pulitzer Prize winning book of poetry, a worker. Maybe I'll visit Machu Picchu, Golden Gate Bridge. Maybe not any of the above. Maybe I'll hide behind an M dash. Maybe hell will freeze over or heaven will turn out to actually be a thing. Maybe Sagrada Familia will be completed and Notre Dame restored and Highway 101 finally widened, whether I get to see the results or not. Maybe the fire never happened. Maybe COVID never happened. Our friends didn't die. Maybe I'll be content with my lot, stop making endless lists, be less fastidious. Maybe I'll go on strike, take a sick day or vacation. Just give up, 
give in, check out, or check in to a luxury hotel and order room service. Maybe someone will sit me down and give me a good talking to, or just listen, hug me, hold me. Maybe I'll reconnect with dear ones. Maybe I'll be a different me and you'll be a different you and we'll understand each other. And the last poem is one that seems good to end with. People seem to uh, <laughs> like the humor in this one, especially other poets. So reasons to keep writing. Because the world needs more poetry. Because there are so many M dashes and so little time. Because every dog should have a poem written about her and every person needs a love poem because it requires all of your attention, because it keeps you sane, and no one will be able to live with you if you don't, because all your friends do, because the best people are poets, because there are clouds, because it gives you a reason to take a walk, because you want to remember, because you need to call on rain, to grieve, to rejoice, to create music, to use your breath. It's legal to repeat, break all the rules, because writing is infinitely inventive, because you can join tradition, repudiate tradition, invent a new form, because it's so lucrative, because you're getting cranky, just to see the reaction you get when you say, I'm a poet. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful, Jody. Uh, I understand when you say this last poem makes sense to a lot of us. It feels to me like a persona poem, uh, very well read, well written. And I feel like right now I want to check into a luxury hotel room and, and order my room service food. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, and uh, this is a great uh, to end today's uh, voice. We have five very distinctive voices from five wonderful, yeah. wonderful readers and poets. And thank you for you all uh, to share your work. Uh, you know, this is uh, Marine Poetry Center's uh, first virtual reading of the season of the traveling show. We will have the second virtual reading on the 29th, hosted by Judy Bertelson. And I will be also helping out. So look forward to seeing you all if you want to join us. Uh, and then especially we, we talk a lot about the motherhood and tomorrow is Father's Day. So we want to say hi, everyone. Happy Father's Day. Um, happy Pride Month. <laughs> <laughs> what else I'm missing? Uh, I just want to be all inclusive and then uh, thank you for being here. You know, we can go anywhere. <laughs> it's a traveling season for summertime or we can go outdoors, but you are here and then you are, you are giving us this heartwarming hour of reading. And then this is precious, very precious. And if you are aim, I'm going to save the uh, closed captioning today as well as the chat uh, space for you to have it all. Uh, and I will record this recorded session. I'm going to send it to all the readers. Okay. So thank you. Have great. a great, great summer. And then if you feel like uh, you, well, you want to open up and mute yourself and say bye to everyone. And thank you uh, to end the note with Jody's poem. And then I really appreciate everyone's work. You guys are awesome. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, Anne. Lovely to hear everyone. Thank you. So lovely. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye, I'll take care.